Okay. All right, good. We're on.
Good morning and welcome to Havity Grace United Methodist Church, where we learn and grow as followers of Jesus Christ to serve others and transform lives here, across the street, and around the world. We are glad that you're tuned in with us today. We know folk are tuning in from across town and around the county and across the state and the nation and even around the globe. So we welcome all of you. Even though our buildings are closed, the church is not. And so we come to you uh, in this way, live streaming. Our Reopening Well Task Force continues planning for reuniting safely 2020 and will be cautious to value human life and health. Please respond to the survey that's in the July edition of The Visitor in order to help us plan. We will take that input and use that in planning to go forward. This is an opportunity uh, right now, if you haven't already, to run and get, get something to eat and something to drink because we're gonna be celebrating a, a Wesleyan love feast later on in worship, so a piece of bread or a cracker uh, and some water or something fancier than that. You, you are welcome to be creative in what you eat and drink today. 60 years ago today, our sister Linda in South Carolina became a full or professing member of Happy Grace United Methodist Church, along with her friends Susan and Carol, who's, who both sadly died rather young. But I wanted to give a shout out to Linda today on the 60th anniversary of her becoming a member here. Today we celebrate Independence Sunday as we are mindful of our freedoms and of our flaws as a nation and the work we need to do to make real the promise embedded in the Declaration of Independence that all folk are created equal. For those who have grown up in Happy Grace or who have lived here a long time, and so those who are viewing this from far away understand. I'm aware of the loss it is to the city, both economically and emotionally, that the usual Independence Day festivities are canceled. Usually this day, there would be the parade and fireworks and vendors and large crowds and family gatherings and cookouts. Our church and our scout troops and our scout packs would be in the parade. When I first came to Happy Grace, I began to understand this as I was planning funerals with families. When I would ask about memories, Fourth of July ranked with Christmas and Thanksgiving for family gatherings. We have available free July-August issues of the Upper Room Devotional Magazine. Just let us know what size print you need and how many and whether you want to pick them up or whether we need to deliver them to your door. Just let us know those things and we will make sure you get them. We are using a different phone today as we uh, come to you live stream, so don't be alarmed if you hear some little dinging noises. Those are just alerts that we weren't able to turn off. Thank you for your continued generosity and faithfulness in supporting Christ ministry here, for helping each other, and for staying safe. And thank you to Dan Rusin, our camera person today, while our regular camera person is out of town, and to Paul Malden, our sound tech, and I'm assisted today in leading worship by Brittany, our liturgist, and she'll be calling us to worship. Good morning. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. For the law of the Spirit of life in Jesus Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. Therefore, let us worship God in the freedom of grace by proclaiming release to the captives letting the oppressed go free, and proclaiming the Lord's favor. Now we're going to pass the peace. As a sign of reconciliation Jesus Christ has made between us and God and our desire to be reconciled with others, we pass God's peace. May the peace of the Lord be with us all. No. Catherine Lee Bates looked down from the top of Pikes Peak upon the plains of our Midwest, and saw their amber waves of grain. On her way out west, she had seen the alabaster buildings of the 1893 Columbian Exposition in Chicago. But friends, our cities are not undimmed by human tears. And so the strength of her poem lies in its vision of a better nation. Hear now the lyrics as Christ, as Christ plays for us the tune of America the Beautiful. Beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, 
For purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. O oh, beautiful for heroes proved in liberating strife, who more than self their country loved, and mercy more than life. America, America, may God thy gold refine, till all success be nobleness, and every gain divine. O oh, beautiful for hatred dream that sees beyond the years thine alabaster cities gleam undimmed by human tears. America, America, God mend thine every flaw, confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. As we get ready to go to God in prayer as a caring and praying congregation, I bid your prayers for those who have lost loved ones to COVID-19. And I bid your prayers for our young brother Joshua, who is away at school in Atlanta. He has tested positive for COVID and is quarantined for 14 days. Praise God, he does not have any symptoms. I bid your prayers for all those who are battling COVID-19. Hospitalizations are rising in Maryland and are at the highest numbers ever across the country. I bid your prayers for our sister Jean, who is on hospice care, and her son Alan, who's our primary caregiver. I bid your prayers for Meredith, whose mother Judy is in hospice care, and for Meredith's family and friends. I bid your prayers for Linda, a friend of ours who is recovering from surgery for cancer. She's a widow with a 14-year-old son. I bid your prayers for our brother Tom, the husband of Anne. Tom is battling lung cancer. However, his leg, which had been injured, injured is much better. I bid your prayers for Carol Ann's caregiver. Carol Ann is a friend of Linda. Her caregiver will be receiving chemo for a large tumor in his chest. I bid your prayers for David, uh, the son of Dr. Jim, who has an inoperable brain aneurysm. Pray for relief from pain. I bid your prayers for Rosemary, a friend of Linda and Ned. Rosemary is in Upper Chesapeake Medical Center. I bid your prayers for Donald, the son of our brother Jim. Donald's in rehab for foot issues and still off of work. Donald lives out in Lansing, Illinois. I bid your prayers for Grace, a friend of our sister Carol. Grace is battling cancer and recovering from surgery. I bid your prayers for Asa, the nephew of our sister June. He is at Harford Memorial Hospital battling pneumonia and the family is very concerned because he has another underlying condition. I bid your prayers for Carrie, the daughter of Karen. Karen's a friend of Carol and Carrie is recuperating from a second serious stroke but is home from the hospital. I bid your prayers for the first responders at a fire station in Corpus Christi, Texas, where Matt, the son of our sister Peg, is connected. 20 of the firefighters at that station have tested positive for COVID. Matt, however, um, has been working off site, so he's not been exposed. I bid your prayers for public health and medical workers and researchers and caregivers for those quarantined at home. Friends, pray for our nation, for justice and an end to racism that we may come together as a society. I bid your prayers for pastors and congregations going through transition and getting to know each other during the pandemic because today is the first day for United Methodist pastors appointed to new churches to be in their pulpits. I bid your prayers for Salona and Julie who are visiting their grandfather and father, Ralph, who is battling cancer. Pray for travel mercies and a good checkup. I bid your prayers for Renji, Michaela's dog who's undergoing tests. Let us thank God today for our many blessings. Our sister Nikki sends this note. She thanks you for your cards and notes while recovering from surgery. 
She says, the first weeks and months have been challenging for her and her husband, Tom, but your prayers and well wishes have kept them going and physical therapy has given her the chance to walk again and more muscles than she's had in a while. We praise God that Nikki, the husband of June, is much better. We praise God that James, the friend of our sister Laurie, has avoided getting COVID, and she thanks you for your prayers. We praise God that Kyle is cancer-free, and we praise God that Guy, an employee of our brother Brent, is feeling much better. We praise God today that Tracy, a friend of our sister Carol, is done with her radiation and chemo. And we thank God for medical first responders, makers of medical equipment, the blessings of relationships, and technologies to keep us connected. We praise God today that our brother Dan is celebrating retirement after 19 years teaching in Cecil County Public Schools. And we share in the joy of our young brother Robbie, who celebrated his 13th birthday this past week, and we join in sharing with our sister Ashley, who is our Facebook manager, that today is her birthday. Happy birthday, Ashley. With our hearts and minds filled with these joys and concerns, let us turn to God in silent prayer as we share with God the things that are not named aloud. O oh Lord, our God, heal us in our hour of need. Our nation is ravaged by a virus and an epidemic of violence. Comfort the grieving, heal the ill, the injured, and the addicted. Encourage the dispirited and strengthen all who work for healing and justice and peace and to make us a better people. Unite us, Lord, as a nation. Unite us as your people. Bring together new pastors and their charges that they may form effective partnerships of service. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the freedoms, resources, and opportunities we have. Opportunities to right wrongs and to thrive as a nation. Thank you for healing and for illnesses avoided and for all who faithfully work to keep us safe and well. Thank you for rest well earned after faithful service and for new fields of service and inquiry. Thank you, Lord, for those who study how to keep us safe and for all who work to maintain our mental health. Thank you most of all for Christ, our living Lord and our divine healer. Amen. Now is the time when I get to talk to the children uh, out there who are joining us. So I want to give a shout out to some of the children. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Zoe and Scout and Wyatt, to Amelia and Will, Michael and Lillian, and Jesse and Maddie, and Evelyn and Camille, Ian and Bodie, Isabella and Emmy, Ellie and Taylor, Hazel and Iris, Max and Nolan, Eli and Elena, Andrew and Kate, Breezy and Ileana, and Sarah and Adeline and Lorelai. And please, please let me know if I have not named your child because I'll be glad to do that next Sunday. So I wanted to talk a little bit about hands, about our hands. You know, our hands are amazing things. They really are. Because we have thumbs, we can pick up things. We can spin things to play. We can grab stuff. We can catch a ball. We can, we can work. We can play. We can pet a cat or pet a dog. We can pat someone who's been hurt. There's so many wonderful things we can do with our hands. We can eat with our hands. We can handle a fork or a spoon or a knife with our hands. Hands are amazing things. Hands should never be used to hit. Hands are not made for hitting. They're made for other wonderful things. And so I thought this week, 
each time that you wash your hands, because right now we're doing a lot of hand washing, and I'm guessing that your parents have really been having you wash your hands, and they're washing their hands all the time. When you wash your hands, say, thank you, God, for our wonderful hands. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for giving us hands. And thank you for sending us Jesus, whose hands were so gentle and wonderful. Hands that he used to heal people and to hug little children and take them on his lap. Lord God, remind us that our hands are Jesus' hands. Help us to use our hands to be helpers, to use our hands in kind ways, so that our hands may truly be Jesus' hands. In his name we pray, amen. So remember, when you wash your hands this week, say thank you, God, for our wonderful hands. The epistle lesson today comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. In Ephesians, written to be shared among the churches of Asia Minor, the Apostle Paul, or his disciple, offers helpful advice. Here, in vivid language, the author uses the image of a Roman soldier's armor to describe the aids God offers us in our struggle to live faithful lives. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand evil on that day, and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. The Gospel lesson today comes from the book of Mark, chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. After stilling the storm on Lake Galilee at night, Jesus arrives in a non-Jewish area and even here brings healing. It's a long one. They came to the other side of the lake, to the country of the Gerasenes, and when he had stepped out of the boat, immediately a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. He lived among the tombs, and no one could restrain him anymore, even with a chain, for he had often been restrained with shackles and chains, but the chains he wrenched apart and the shackles he broke in pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always howling and bruising himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed down before him, and he shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he had said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. He begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there on the hillside a great herd of swine was feeding, and the unclean spirits begged him, Send us into the swine, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came down and entered the swine. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned in the lake. The swine herds ran off and told it in the city and in the country, the people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and to see the demoniac sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and the very man who had had the legion, and they were afraid. Those who had seen what had happened to the demoniac and to the swine reported it. Then they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed by the demons begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus refused and said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. And he went away and began to pro proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed. Hear, church, what the Spirit has said.
The COVID-19 pandemic has shed light on some things. These aren't new things. These are not new truths. They're things we, we knew already and I think maybe forgot or neglected. And so we're being reminded now of what's important. Today we focus on Christ's call to love one another to love one another. This time of restrictions for health safety has been stressful. Different folk find different parts of this experience challenging in different ways for different reasons. And so Christ calls us to be especially kind to each other in this difficult time. There is no doubt that the need to be sequestered, if you will, to be quarantined, during this pandemic has been stressful. Here's some advice that came from my health insurance carrier. Get close, develop trust, build relationships. Getting close to someone boosts our production of oxytocin, the happy hormone. So give a hug, hold hands, or touch in other ways to strengthen trust in your relationships. Clearly that advice was written before the pandemic. Sometimes the very thing we crave, the very thing we need, is the very thing we cannot have because of the pandemic. And that's stressful. Here's something from a briefing for a job, probably provided by video conference, about coping with stress during the COVID-19 pandemic. It describes both negative and positive techniques for coping with stress. Smoking or vaping or talking to family, friends about stress, excess alcohol use or exercise, illicit drugs or deep breathing, food binging or listening to music, staying in bed all day or reading. That last one I gotta say, I think I could stay in bed all day and read, but anyway, I get their point. If we're an extrovert, the lockdown may have triggered loneliness. If we're an introvert, it may have made us more inward turned and less able to converse with others. And friends, God's people are not spared from stress. If you don't believe me, read Psalm 22 where it says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or Psalms 42 and 43, which really belong together, where it says, why is my heart cast down within me? Or read any of a whole lot of other Psalms that have a very similar theme. So for each of us, it's worth pondering, what is my trigger? What's my trigger? What's the thing the pandemic triggers in me? What's my stress reaction? A helpful spiritual and practical principle here is that we don't get rid of bad things without replacing them with good ones. The briefing above about techniques for coping with stress does not just say, don't do this or that. It says, replace this or that with something else. Jesus says if an unclean spirit is driven out of someone and finds no new host to possess, it will return to its home with seven worse spirits and make the person even more miserable. So it is with habits. The best way to get rid of a bad habit is to replace it with a good one. For the absence of evil is not good, but nothing. Far better to practice good. I'm struck by the similarity in the briefing about coping with stress to Paul's letter to the church, to the, to the church at Galatia. Paul was struggling with them at this point in time, and yet at the end of a fairly angry letter, he stops near the end to offer them two opposing lists. One is what he calls the works of the flesh or vices. The other is the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Our epistle lesson today offers another list. Those powers or aids that God in Christ offers us to oppose the forces of evil in our own lives. Using the metaphor of a Roman soldier's equipment, he lists truth, 
righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, and the word of God. The author of this passage personifies evil as the devil and speaks of the cosmic powers of this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil. Now, I am not one for personifying the evil, but whether we feel folk are struggling during the pandemic because of satanic attack, or because it triggers mental health issues, or because of a combination of these in which there is demonic possession of our weak areas, that is, the devil is exploiting our vulnerabilities and our psychological weaknesses, Regardless of how we view all that, Jesus shows us something very important in his healing of the Gerasene demoniac in our gospel lesson. First, let me admit, it's a lot of fun just to say, Gerasene demoniac. How often do you get to use that phrase on the street? You know, what do you do for a living? Well, I'm a demoniac. What's your political party? I'm a registered demoniac. Or what kind of car do you drive? A 2015 demoniac? Yeah, we don't hear that much around. The demoniac from the region of Garasa is a tragic figure. He is said to be possessed by thousands of demons. A legion, five to 6,000. A mob of evil. That's why he's called a demoniac. He's possessed by demons. His behavior is obviously self-destructive. He hurts himself. And I suspect, although the Bible does not say so, that he inspires fear in those around him because of his unusual behavior and his unusual strength. It is all the more telling then that at the end of the story, the neighbors are not rejoicing in the man's healing, but are begging Jesus to go away. They're more afraid of Jesus than they were the man. In the end, Jesus heals the Gerasene man. Christ frees the demoniac from those forces that had previously imprisoned him. You see, God stands against anything that makes us ill or hurt or demeaned. Jesus works God's will in throwing down the forces of sin and sickness, evil and death, for God wills our wholeness. God wants us to be whole, healthy, and fulfilled and happy. Some may say that the garrison man's behavior is really mental illness, which ancient people didn't understand. And that may be. But again, this story gets something very important, absolutely correct. Notice that Jesus does not blame the man for his condition, nor do Christ's disciples or the man's neighbors. They understand the nexus of the problem to be outside of the person rather than a moral failing. We often in this country want to blame the victim because it separates us from them. It quells our fear that what has happened to them might happen to us, and it gets us off the hook for bearing any responsibility for their condition. We're inclined to do that about the victims of police violence, those who deal with addiction, those who are sick, or who struggle with mental health, or who are poor. We are helped, however, we are helped by the sciences of sociology and economics to understand how societal forces work to harm or benefit groups of people regardless of individual behavior. We're also helped by the contemporary understanding of addiction as an illness and of mental illness as relating to chemical issues in the brain rather than seeing them as a failure of character. We can see the nexus of the problem is outside the person not that folk don't have responsibility to do their best and take their medications and go to meetings and so on. In the end, in the end, Christ heals the man. He heals the man even in the non-Jewish pagan area of Gerasa because God is Lord of the whole earth, not just little bits of it. The man wants to follow Jesus, which is a wonderful thing and something to which Jesus invites all of us. But Jesus rather surprisingly says, no, no, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and the mercy God has shown you. The garrison man is to be an evangelist in his own backyard, 
sharing the good news. And that's not a bad model for us. Christ, the one who comes to show us God's love, calls us to do the same thing, to show others love, to love one another as God loves us, for that in itself is a healing thing. So we are to love one another by practicing safe health guidelines to keep each other well. And in this season of pandemic, we're called to cut each other a little slack to be kind to each other. Because folk may not be themselves. They may be sullen or snappish or emotional or cold or distant. We are called to apply the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Christ our Lord invites all of us who love him to confess our sin. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Let us pray. O oh God of love, we confess that we have betrayed you by misrepresenting who you are. Forgive us for our harsh thoughts and words toward others. Forgive us for blaming those who are stressed, ill, or poor for their condition. Forgive us for holding others to a higher standard of righteous, righteousness than we can meet. Help us and heal us, lifting us to a better plane, that we may love others as you love us, in Christ our Redeemer. Amen. And now as we seek to repent of our sin and live in peace with one another. Let us pray in silence as we make our own humble and silent confessions to Almighty God. Amen. Hear now the good news, the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Our next hymn is a contemporary text about things Jesus did with his hands. Healed, washed, blessed, and saved. And it's a prayer that we may use our hands to do good too. Hear now the lyrics as Chris plays for us the tune. Jesus' hands were kind hands, doing good to all, healing pain and sickness, blessing children small, washing tired feet, and saving those who fall. Jesus' hands were kind hands, doing good to all. So take my hands, Lord Jesus, let them work for you. Make them strong and gentle, kind in all I do. Let me watch you, Jesus, till I'm gentle too, till my hands are kind hands, quick to work for you. As we recommit ourselves to love others as Christ loves us, Thank you for continuing your support of Christ's ministry here at Habity Grace United Methodist Church. And now let us pray in silence as we ponder this question, who needs to feel our kindness the most?
Our doxology today is a translation of a 7th century Latin text, and it uses the word benediction. Now, we think of a benediction as a closing uh, of worship. Literally, benediction means a good word. In this context, the word benediction means blessing. So hear the lyrics as Chris plays for us the tune of Christ has made the sure foundation. To this temple where we call thee, come, O Lord of hosts, today. With thy faithful loving kindness, hear thy people as they shed within its walls away. Laud and honor to the Father, laud and honor to the Son, laud and honor to the Spirit, ever three and ever one, one in might and one in glory, while on ending ages run. Amazingly generous God, thank you for your many gifts to us. Praise to you especially for the fruit of your spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Thank you for your willingness to care for and protect us through Christ our Savior. We come now in our order of worship to the place where we celebrate the Wesleyan Love Feast. This comes down to us from John Wesley, who borrowed it from the Moravian tradition. So if you have some food and something to drink handy at home, just have those close by you. When circumstances and concern for the common good keep us from gathering to share communion in person, we gather instead to pray, separated in body and yet one in the spirit and one in Christ Jesus. God is with us, and so we are not alone. Christ is with us, the risen one has met us, blessed and fed us along the way that leads us home. The community of the Holy Spirit is with us, and so we gather with the communion of saints and light throughout history and with God's people around the world with brothers and sisters absent in body but united in spirit, let us pray. Holy One, Trinity of grace and power, maker and mother, beloved and lover, father and friend, thanks be to you, O God. You are ever the Father who gives us bread, not stones. You are the mother who never forgets we are her own. From the beginning of life to the closing of time, you are the one who is with us to the end. And so with all who breathe on earth and all who sing in heaven, we praise your name and join creation's song. Thy bountiful care what tongue can recite. It breathes in the air, it shines in the light, it streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. You created a land rich in resources and set before the founders and pioneers of our nation an opportunity beyond measure to build a realm of justice, peace, and freedom to be a blessing to all the world. And even when we have abused your land and its residents and turned aside from your ways, you've been slow to anger and abounding in mercy. And through many voices, you have called us back to your way and nurtured in our hearts a noble dream. You have provided a land filled with food whose amber waves of grain bless us again and again more than in many parts of the globe. And yet, we have hunger here too that we need to address. And so, with gratitude for what we have, we take a piece of food and hold it. Christ broke bread and fed the crowds broke bread and formed a new covenant with his closest friends, broke bread and was made known to his followers in the village of Emmaus. Bread reminds us that just as grains of wheat are gathered together to make a single loaf, we, though scattered, are one body in Christ. Amen. 
And now you may eat what you have there at home and know that Christ's love surrounds you. Let us pray. You, Lord, have provided us a land whose hills are filled with streams of running water, whose rivers flow to the shining sea, whose bays provide us food and pleasure. And so we hold our drink and remember with gratitude. Through water, you sustain life. You, Lord, provide the early and the late rains. They soften the earth and bring forth green, growing plants and trees, leaves and flowers and fruit. Your mercies, like showers, fall upon us from heaven, the love and grace that we all receive. Amen. And so now, whatever you have to drink at home, go ahead and drink it slowly. Feel God's love flowing into you. And know that God, blesses us beyond all measure. For we now on earth have union with God the three in one and mystic sweet communion with those whose rest is one. O happy ones and holy, God give us grace that we like them, the meek and lowly on high may dwell with thee. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you speak to us words of life. Call forth in us rivers of living water and feed our deepest hunger. In hard times of loneliness or confusion, of fear or helplessness, when we feel most alone, remind us that we are never alone, for you're always with us. Hear us and pray for us in our weakness with sighs too deep for words as we lift up to you those who we love, especially those from whom we are separated. Those who are sick, suffering, dying, grieving, or providing care. Those whose lives are cut short by unjust acts of violence because of the color of their skin those who are blind to the reality of racism, and those who are frustrated by the inability to work good change. God of compassion, fill us with your grace and inspire us to be your instruments of mercy and hope through Christ our Lord and the Holy Spirit, who teach us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, as we prepare to end worship, as the sun rises, pray to our loving God. With each new dawn, renew your trust in God, your delight to do justice, and your gladness to be in God's presence. Go forth in Christ's name and in the power of the Holy Spirit to be a people of hope. Amen.